This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Assassin We here at the Word of the Week are big fans of Dungeons & Dragons and other tabletop games of that ilk. That's not a secret. It's literally where the GM in the title of this podcast comes from. But that doesn't mean that we're only fans of Dungeons & Dragons. We read a lot. And we play a lot of other games of a lot of different types. And we watch movies and TV. And sometimes, rarely, we even crack open a comic book. And that's important because sometimes there are some really interesting concepts that aren't very strongly represented in Dungeons & Dragons. Take, for example, the assassin. Now, there have been assassins in Dungeons & Dragons. But they're sort of a one-off thing. In recent editions, they're basically an advanced specialization for rogues and thieves. Because pickpocketing is basically a gateway to slitting throats for hire as part of an ancient, secret order of murderers. The thing is, Dungeons & Dragons is a fairly team-based game of heroic fantasy adventure. And that doesn't really leave a place for the murderous, stealthy loner. At least... It doesn't once you graduate from junior high school and stop playing with antisocial little imps who spend all their time stealing from each other. And kinder. But that doesn't mean that assassins don't feature in all sorts of other fantasy games and media. If we're honest, our favorite assassins are the assassins of Ankh Morpork that featured in many of the late Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels. If you've never read the Discworld novels, well, you really should. Because there is something for everyone in these comic fantasy satires. See, the series of 41 books, yes, 41, doesn't really represent one story. Instead, it's a collection of many, many stories that come from one ridiculous world. A flat, disc-shaped world huddled off by four massive elephants who are themselves riding on the back of a massive space turtle named Atuin. And it includes a bit of everything. Send-ups of epic fantasy, comic retellings of various fairy tales, bits of horror, chunks of steampunk and spellpunk, and a lot of very subtle but heartfelt commentary on real-world issues like the advancement of science and technology, the nature of faith, the value of art, philosophy and ethics, economics, and even politics. Although any given Discworld novel can stand alone, there are several books that connect together into broad story arcs, mainly because they involve the same characters. The first novel, The Color of Magic, introduced Rincewind, an incompetent but sarcastic and genre-savvy born loser of a wizard, with two Z. And it also introduced the Discworld's largest city, Ankh Morpork, and the Wizard's College at its heart, known as the Unseen University. And if you're a fan of Dungeons and Dragons, the various stories about the Wizards of Unseen University will be right up your alley. But the Unseen University is just one of many, many guilds and orders and leagues and schools in the city of Ankh Morpork. There's a guild for everything. And that brings us around to the Assassin's Guild. And we're only spending the time on it because its history is going to sound very familiar by the time you're done listening to this episode. The Assassin's Guild is an order of assassins, stealthy, secretive killers for hire. But the Assassins are not street thugs. They pride themselves on being gentlemen murderers, killers of kings and kings of killers. They have class, style, and panache. But while the Assassin's Guild of Ankh Morpork claims to be the only such organization in all of Discworld, it was actually brought to the city by a knight named Sir Giles de Munfort. Sir Giles got the idea for opening his school for gentlemen assassins while on a holy crusade in the Discworld's arabesque land of Clatch. Sir Giles learned everything about assassination from a secret order there and brought all of their lessons back 
except the one about using drugs. But we digress. If humorous fantasy isn't your cup of arsenic laced tea, perhaps you like video games. And if you like open world exploration, action, and adventure, maybe you've played some of the installments in Ubisoft's now massive franchise about skulking murderers, Assassin's Creed. Now, we here at the Word of the Week have to confess that we've not played all of the Assassin's Creed games. We just don't have the time we'd need to play ten main console games, numerous portable consoles, and God knows how many mobile games. The Assassin's Creed series makes franchises like Friday the 13th and Final Destination seem restrained by comparison. In fact, we've only ever got as far as the Renaissance. So we missed out on a lot of the nonsense wherein the various Roman gods were trying to prevent a solar flare from bringing about the Mayan calendar disaster by using mind-controlled technologies on Neanderthals, which they then hid by founding the Catholic Church so they could hide them under the Vatican. Or something. We frankly find that backstory both baffling and distracting. But we do know about the stories in the first couple of installments. And those lead to some interesting places. But to understand that... We have to understand how Assassin's Creed games came about. The story begins in 1989 and the birth of an entirely new genre of video games, and also the birth of a new technology for creating video game graphics. See, there was this guy at Yale University named Jordan Mechner, and he was a big fan of video games. Most importantly, he wanted to create video games. He just wasn't very good at it, at least not at first. He created several arcade games and games for the Apple II home computer and submitted them to various publishers, but they were all rejected. That is, until he hit on the idea of combining martial arts style fighting with side-scrolling platforming. In 1984, after two years of work, he submitted a game called Karatika to publisher Broderbund. It was a simple game, run to the right and punch and kick your way through an evil samurai's guards until the princess is rescued. But it had just the right mix of elements to make it a hit. Mechner then spent the next three years working on what would become his claim to fame. Originally titled The Prince, the game was eventually renamed Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia was an adventure platformer, but unlike its contemporaries in the genre, the game's protagonist's abilities were grounded a bit more in reality. Unlike, for example, Mario and Luigi, who could jump three times their own height from a standing start, the titular prince's movements were more limited. His high jumps weren't very high, but he could grab ledges above himself and pull himself up. If he fell from too great a height, he would quickly find out what his knees looked like from underneath, but to compensate, he could hang from ledges and drop carefully. With a running start, he could manage to jump over a pit and catch himself on the ledge on the other side. And this sort of design gave rise to what is commonly called the realistic platformer. The game's controls lent themselves to a more measured, slower-paced style of careful play. And everything was built around this. Instead of running to the right and trying to reach a goal, the prince would slowly and carefully explore a labyrinthine Persian palace climbing and dropping and long jumping and sneaking. And when he got into a fight, that fight was a duel. Advance, retreat, cut, thrust, and block. The slower pace of the game and the measured movements of the protagonist also allowed Mechner to play with a new animation style called rotoscoping. The basic idea was to film an actual human being doing actual actions, pick out the frames you liked, and trace over them to draw the game's graphics. In Mechner's case, he filmed his martial arts instructor running and jumping and climbing and crawling and fighting. And the result was very smooth, very detailed graphics. Prince of Persia was a great success. Despite being brutally difficult, its style, both in gameplay and graphics, were recognized as great innovation and it led to the creation of other games in a similar graphical style, like Eric Cahy's famous cult classic Out of This World, also known as Another World. And Prince of Persia itself became a major franchise. 
Flash forward a few years to game developer Ubisoft's Montreal division. Ubisoft Montreal had been known primarily for its B-list licensed video game titles, including such classics as Donald Duck going quackers. But in 2002, they managed to earn themselves some respect, with a stealth action game developed in partnership with spy thriller writer Tom Clancy. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell was a commercial success, and as a result, Ubisoft was ready to trust Ubisoft Montreal with another project and producer Yanis Malik, and designer Patrice de Soleil, who had not been part of the Splinter Cell team, were eager to prove themselves. They proposed a historical action-adventure platformer. More specifically, they wanted to revive Prince of Persia. Now, Ubisoft didn't own the rights to the Prince of Persia franchise, but because the previous attempt to revive the series and bring it into the 3D era had been such a commercial flop, the rights were available for sale. And so was Jordan Mechner. A few years later, Mechner, Mallet, De Soleil, and the rest of the team brought Prince of Persia, Sands of Time, to the world. And there was much rejoicing. The prince had gone from slow and measured to acrobatic, free-running parkour artist. The combat was fluid and exciting. The game was atmospheric. De Soleil wanted to do more. See, De Soleil had become deeply engrossed in Middle Eastern architecture and history as a result of his work on Prince of Persia, and he wanted to let players fall into that world too. He envisioned a game in which the players could freely explore real-life ancient cities, to leap from rooftops and awnings, sneak through alleyways, and climb to the tops of massive minarets and spires. Unfortunately, that wasn't quite the experience that Prince of Persia offered. And then, in his readings, De Soleil learned about a 12th century order of killers for hire called the Hashashin. He found their code of conduct particularly interesting. The order refused to harm innocents. And while they veiled themselves in secrecy, their code demanded that their assassinations be carried out publicly and in spectacular fashion to instill awe and fear. And so the Assassin's Creed franchise was born. The game, at least the first few, tell the story of a man named Desmond Miles, who is kidnapped by a technology corporation known as Absturgo Industries. Desmond is put into a device called the Animus, which can access his genetic memories and allow him to relive the memories of his ancestors. And as it turns out, his ancestors were all assassins in various historical periods. In the first game, he plays out the life of Al-Tayr ibn Lahad in the Middle Eastern cities of Jerusalem, Acre, and Damascus during the Third Crusade. Later adventures put him in the mind of Ezio Auditore de Firenze in Renaissance Italy. And then he explores colonial America. And then he's a pirate, and then we sort of lose track. The reason for all of this is because Desmond's ancestors were all members of the Brotherhood of Assassins, and Absturgo is run by the descendants of the Knights Templar, and the two organizations have been warring over ancient religious artifacts that will allow whoever has them to rule the world. And then comes Jupiter and Juno and Minerva, creating humanity and mind control and solar flare disasters, and it all gets sort of weird. Now, Ubisoft wasn't the first to conceive of the idea of accessing someone's genetic memories to see what their ancestors were up to in the past. In fact, in 2012, science fiction author John Bazewinger sued Ubisoft for copyright infringement because he had used the same plot device in his novel, Link. Bazewinger, by all accounts, didn't have much of a case to begin with but he engaged in such vicious mudslinging and fiery rhetoric to drum up publicity that, ultimately, Ubisoft threatened to countersue if he didn't drop the suit. A few months later, he apparently did so, though he was extremely grudging about it, and Ubisoft threatened further suits for slander if he didn't just shut up. After that, the case went very quiet. But the concept of genetic memory was not something created by either Ubisoft or Bazewinger. In fact, the idea is much older 
and it has been the subject of ongoing debate in the scientific community for ages. And it starts with DNA. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is a very long, very complex molecule that resides at the heart of every one of the cells in your body, except the red blood cells. And a few others, just don't email us, we're being general. DNA is famously shaped like a twisted up ladder, and as such, there are two parts. The ladder's rails provide the skeleton for DNA, but the important part is the rungs of the ladder. Each rung consists of different chemicals. There are four to choose from, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And the specific sequence of these chemicals varies from species to species and individual to individual. And encoded in that sequence are the instructions for constructing every protein in your body, along with triggers that determine when those proteins should be made. Basically, it's an instruction manual for building you. Your genetic makeup, your DNA sequence, is a mishmash of the sequences from both of your parents. It is set at the time you are conceived, and it controls your growth and development. As a result, your DNA carries a record of your ancestry, and your ancestors' ancestry. In fact, there are huge chunks of your genetic code that are the same as the codes in fruit flies and even single-celled animals, because all living things can trace their ancestry back to the same place if you go far enough. So it seems reasonable that DNA could remember your ancestors, right? Well, not quite. Because the gene sequence in every one of your cells is just a whole bunch of copies of the original one that your mother and father made for you when the stork planted you in the cabbage patch. Your experiences don't change it. So, while it encodes biological traits like hair color and eye color and height and sex and predisposition towards certain diseases or personality traits, and the inability to digest the amino acid phenylalanine, which makes diet soda toxic to you, DNA does not include your lived experiences. The only thing your DNA knows about your Arabian assassin ancestor is his hair color and whether he was a hemophiliac. Maybe. Or so we thought. First, studies have determined that certain traits and skills are in fact hardwired into our genetic code. These skills include the capacity for language and even basic math skills, such as an innate ability to count or to recognize concepts like more and less, and combinations and subtraction. That doesn't mean you can be born with the ability to speak Mandarin or to do calculus, of course. But it does mean you've had the basic skills needed to learn those skills encoded in your genetic structure for 20 to 40,000 years, according to some estimates. But that can all be explained by the same evolutionary and inheritance process as any other trait, right? What about actual learned experiences being passed from parent to child without instruction? Turns out that even that might be possible, according to several recent experiments. One of the more famous was conducted in 2013 at the University College London. In the experiment, researchers taught mice to fear a particular smell. They would expose the mice to the smell and then deliver electric shock. Eventually, the mice associated the smell with pain and would become agitated whenever they were exposed to the smell. When the mice later gave birth, the children were taken away before they could learn any behaviors from the parent. And strangely enough, they had the same aversion to the smell. Now, that doesn't mean that the mice necessarily changed their DNA or that genetics were the mechanism by which the smell aversion was passed down. Other biological mechanisms have been proposed. But there is still a growing body of evidence that, at the very least, the genetic code isn't the only means by which traits can be inherited from parents. It's a far cry from living out the life of your ancestors through virtual reality, admittedly. But it's still pretty cool. But what about the assassins? Well, it turns out, as you might have guessed, that the Hashashans were in fact a real organization that really did originate in the Middle East. In fact, the modern word assassin is derived from the name Hashashan, which is probably not surprising. What may be a little more surprising is that they both originate from the word hashish, 
or hash, a drug made from the resin of the cannabis plant. Yes, the same plant from which marijuana is made. The leaves give you marijuana. The resin or oil gives you hashish. Now, we don't actually know much about the hashashans and their history, except by second and third hand accounts of their various enemies or from the fanciful tales of Europeans. That's partly because secret organizations are secretive. But that's also because in 1256 CE, the Hashashan's fortress was conquered and their library was put to the torch. We do, however, know a bit about how and when they were founded. In 1090 CE, a member of the Ismaili sect of Shia Islam by the name of Hassan e Sabah led a group of his followers to secretly infiltrate the castle of the king of Dalem and take it over, ousting the king. See, during this time, the Islamic Caliphate, the Empire of Islam, was undergoing a great period of expansion and conquest, first consolidating their power in the Middle East by conquering the kingdoms that remained after the fall of the Persian empires and then spreading into India, North Africa, and eventually into Spain and Asia Minor, which would lead them into conflict with the Europeans. At the same time, infighting between various sects of the Islamic faith was becoming increasingly common. From his newly claimed mountain top fortress, Sabah established a network of strongholds for his faithful followers throughout the Middle East, and they gradually began eliminating the current rulers of the Islamic Caliphate the Islamic Turks of the Sunni branch of Islam. And the primary means of elimination was infiltration and assassination. A Hashashan would begin by studying his target, learning his culture and language so that he could gradually join the target's trusted inner circle. The targets were often Sunni clerks, Turkish caliphs, or other officials. The Hashashan would pretend to be a servant or advisor, sometimes spending several years in apparent servitude. And then, suddenly, the Hashashan would spring out and violently murder their target. The Hashashan would rarely escape punishment for their bold actions and were usually executed, but their faith ensured that they would be rewarded in the paradise of the afterlife for their actions. For the next 200 years, the Sunni Turks lived in terror of the Hashashans. According to some accounts, Sunni leaders took to wearing concealed armor at all times for fear of an assassin's blade. And then, two fatal mistakes brought about the end of Sabah's Hashashans. The first occurred when the ruler of Khwarezm decided to slaughter a group of Mongol traders in his city in 1219 CE. See, the Mongols of Central Asia had mostly been ignoring the kingdoms of the Middle East beyond engaging in occasional trade with some of the border kingdoms. But at this affront, Genghis Khan, leader of the Mongols, swore revenge and led his army into the small Persian kingdom on the border of the Islamic Caliphate. And he destroyed it. And the only thing left unconquered was the mountain fortress of Sabah's Hashashans. And the Hashashans swore loyalty to the Mongols to escape destruction. And things might have continued normally for the Hashashans. The Mongols didn't care to rule the Persian kingdom they'd conquered and left the Hashashans alone. But then, in around 1250 CE, Genghis Khan's grandson set his sights on the riches of the Islamic Caliphate and decided he would march on Baghdad. And when the assassin leader learned about the plan, he sent an assassin team to kill Monkey Kong. The team was exposed, failing in their mission, and Monkey was understandably a little miffed. Miffed enough to send an army to tear down the assassin's primary fortress. And tear it down they did. They leveled the stronghold. And they paraded the assassin leaders before the order's other strongholds, demanding surrender. Each stronghold did. And each stronghold was raised thereafter. And when the assassin's strongholds had all been leveled, the Mongols executed every last assassin they had captured or taken under surrender. And that 
was the end of the assassins. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Thank you.